Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're going to talk about another great movie. You know, I, st I pushed the button. Right? I, I guessed that. I did. Because you said that just now. I did. I missed, <laughs> I missed, the, I missed the best part of that joke. And I'm not going to, we don't have to relive it. Uh -oh. But it was, that was, that was good. I had hoped that I would have pressed the button in time, but I missed that. I'm sorry. I would have thought you would have been all over that. But... No. No. 
It so, was a great joke, this was, ladies and gentlemen. This, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about, this is another in our uh, John Houston series tonight. What is ranked by um, all of the wonderful uh, voters over on IMDb, they rank this as John Houston's best film. Yeah. I think it's hard to disagree with that. No, I, I don't I don't necessarily think. I think John Huston is, you know, the more we look at John Huston, the more you see him as just, I, I think, categorically one of the most brave filmmakers. Just a guy that has unbelievable guts uh, to, to make movies and do things with actors that they are. Uh, otherwise, actors are not prone to do with themselves in their careers. Because, because I mean, heaven knows. John Huston made probably just as many stinkers as he did make great films. Right. But just being a stinker doesn't mean he's any less brave of a filmmaker. Well, exactly. And that's, I think, the point you're making is that even just by being so brave, he's not afraid to take risks and do things that uh, could work out really well or could really work, not work out at all. Right. And, I, you know, I think regardless what you just said, the fact that he is is taking those risks and uh, and challenging everybody, I think, makes him a great filmmaker. Yeah. And this movie, uh, he, he did both. Uh, you know, I think he, he took some fantastic risks, risks with these characters and uh, ended up creating an unbelievable story. Tre treasure of the Sierra Madre. Si. Uh, based on the uh, 1927 book novel of the same name, which I have not read. By B. Traven, a very mysterious character. Mr. B. Traven to you. That's, we'll talk about him a little bit. We should. We should talk about later, him a little bit. Later in this. But This uh, I, film is uh, part of the National Film Registry in the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, and, wait for it, aesthetically significant. Why is this movie significant to you, Andrew? Uh, you know, for me, this is a brilliant character story about uh, the evils of money really and the corruption and uh, internal corruption the psychological breakdown that can really happen because of large quantities of money in this case gold and the psychology of Fred C. Dobbs I think um, played amazingly by Humphrey Bogart I think this is my favorite Humphrey Bogart performance um, more so than any anything else he's done it's it's just painful and tragic and heartbreaking and so real and 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 honest and I think that's what really challenged people at the time when this came out definitely um, you know Humphrey Bogart fans who were you know very much fans of watching him um, well, I mean, obviously he started in the, kind of the crime films, but once he moved out of that and became the leading man in films like um, Casablanca, it certainly was a different tone to play such a despicable character, somebody who's, who takes such a dark turn in the film, and he looks grisly throughout most of the film. He's dirty, he's unshaven, he's just wearing grimy clothes, and he just is so corrupted by this gold that he turns into just a horrible, horrible character. Well, Playing and that's a character like that. I think is just it's, it's it's amazing. It's it it highlights the the his uh, a particular gift of transformation because when this movie film uh, when this movie begins for the first forty five minutes, you 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 get what you expect from Bogart. You know, even though he looks all kind of weathered and his jeans have a little tear in them. Uh, you still get that sort of, um, you know, that swashbuckling kind of savvy. Um, uh, even as he's saying, "Can you buy? Can you can you spare a, a meal for an, a fellow American?" Uh, over and over again uh, to the man in the white suit, the director of John Huston, his own his cameo. You know, even as he's he's doing that, you you get what you expect with Humphrey Bogart. You're, you're sure. watching him. He's he is the he's the hero that I want to to believe in. Definitely. And the transformation that he undergoes, uh, you know, as he is introduced to gold and to greed and to the sort of 
by all rights within the context of the world uh, that we're exploring in this film, easy to come by gold, right? I mean, yeah. they they are led to riches and they discover riches and they are able to get those riches. Uh, you know, he that his journey to corruption is uh, brilliantly metered. Yeah, uh, leading up to the uh you know the his attempted uh murder of of uh you know his buddy yeah of curtain uh, of curtain it's it's fantastic it really is all, all the way through his his complete psychological snap at the end after right. uh, he does think that he killed curtain and um when he's wandering back and forth in the trees yeah, 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 wandering back and forth, and then he's talking to himself. I mean, not talking to himself in a badly done movie sort of way, but talking to himself in a way that defines a person who's completely snapped yeah. from reality. What if he's? And, what if his eyes are open? Ah, what if I? I should have buried his clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that sort of conversation, and it's it's so haunting. And he's like, oh, oh, the tiger got him. Yeah, the tiger. Ha 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 ha. And he's just like, he goes nuts. I mean, it's so creepy. It's so creepy. And then the final moments of him, uh, you know, a few scenes later, I mean, it's just seeing what has become of him and then how the final conflict is met at the hands of Gold Hat, the, the bandit, the head of the bandits. Right. Uh, it's just tragic. It's really tragic. So, but but it's a fitting end. I mean, seeing everything that his character has gone through, it turns into what is a fitting end in the context of this story. This this film came, uh, you know, came toward the later. Uh, I think the portion part of his career. I mean, we've we've already seen him uh, in his leading man roles in Casablanca and uh, you know the the Bogart and Bacall. Um, he had, let's see, what did that come immediately before have and have not immediately before this? No, there were a couple of other movies before this, uh, Sierra yeah. Madre. Uh, but, but we've, we have this experience of Humphrey Bogart, uh, and we've talked about him before, you know, as we talk about the Maltese Falcon in that, that period of under a decade between Maltese Falcon, where we've already established that, that Bogart himself is a, um, you know, is a, uh, kind of a daring actor to do to take on the kinds of anti-hero roles um you know that he had taken on in this in the, the film noir kind of uh, as he's exploring that gestalt uh now we have him taking on a role that is neither the hero nor the anti-hero it's just a, 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 a the guy who is cursed yeah uh and taking a, you know equally great risk with his career um to take on a role like this and yet it end up ends up uh you know helping to define his his breadth as an actor yeah it, and it it really does i mean it's such a great performance by him I, I just i can't speak more highly of him in this film it's just it's so well done and uh yeah it's uh, uh and that coming on the backs of two other amazing performances by two other wonderful actors, Walter Houston, John Houston's father, and Tim Holt, who's just fantastic as Curtin. Yeah, the the trio, uh, you know, okay, so we talk about Bogart, obviously, a lot in this movie, but, um, you know, the, the character that was, uh, oh, well, okay, first of all, I would say that the trio, uh, the three of them, I think, were so perfectly balanced in sort of emotional tone and tenor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Curtin as sort of the the backbone and the stability of of the three of them, and Bogart representing sort of the greed and and you know Walter Houston's role as as um, you know the uh, the prospector. Uh, yeah was again defined that defined a stereotype uh in in a brilliant performance and he was probably for me the most interesting character to watch yeah and and, and interesting also because he's the arbiter between those other two characters right. between the the dark of of you know what a human condition can become and the the positive side of the human the, condition the optimism by curtain 
Right. And he ends up being the the, the prospector, you know, uh, Houston's character ends up being the uh, um, sort of the the cosmic soul, the philosophical soul of the of the piece. I like you, you say he's the arbiter and he, he ends up not only um, uh, philosophically in there in the through the course of the dialogue and the various scenes around the campfire and around the, the mine, but structurally he is always he's sort of portrayed kind of between them. Uh, yeah. when they're on scene together and it's uh it ends up uh it, it really works and of course everything goes downhill when he is taken out of that equation he's mm-hmm. called away to go help help in a small community and uh that's when things really get uh messy between dobbs and curtain right right but yeah we, we should talk about walter houston for a minute because i mean he's he's an amazing actor and actually we already talked well we talked about him a little, a little bit in Maltese Falcon he, he popped up in a cameo um, on his son's request and here you know his uh, John Houston really felt that his father was right for the role B. Traven um, the author didn't feel he was right for the role he, he felt that you know he should go with someone else but John Houston really believed that his father was right and he actually had his father take out his teeth for this and it really helped lend to that old prospector sort of uh, character. And his dad was pretty nervous about doing that at first. But I tell you, once he gets in there, and man, when you see him do his jig when he <laughs> discovers the gold and that <laughs> whole scene, you can see why he won Best Actor or Best, uh, it was the Best Actor or Best Supporting Actor he won for this film. I think it was Best Supporting. Uh, best Supporting Actor, yeah. I mean, he's just, he's just phenomenal in the movie. Really, it was great. He is absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, uh, let's, you know, he's, he's been in so many other really wonderful movies and, um, you know, he's, we're getting to the point where he's, he's an actor that isn't, isn't talked about enough, uh, yeah. as time goes by. He, he is, he, again, he defines roles. He does. He does. And it's, it's sad. He died, um, pretty shortly after this was made, but at least he had a chance to, to uh, win his Oscar uh, for this film and to, uh, you know, thank his son. I, I believe what he said in his Oscar speech was, you know, I always told my son if he, uh, if he, you know, gets up there and is making making movies to make sure that he writes a good part for his old man and, and he did a, a hell of a job or something like that. So yeah. it's a great speech. It is, he's, <laughs> it's wonderful. So, uh, so this... Um, what, what else do you feel is, is structurally important about this film? Why, why is this one? And, and I think it's, you sort of have to talk about it in the context of how it, how it performed, because it was not one that initially was, you know, favored with great success in the it, box office. Well, it was a hard film for people to get into because it was this dark story. It was a, it was a dark tale about, um, these three men going, uh, you know, down on their luck in Mexico who go looking for gold and they find it. And it, it really just, it doesn't really work out very well for them. It's, um, it's kind of a, a, a tragic film. And I think audiences had kind of a hard time with it. And like, like I said, they really wanted to see, uh, Humphrey Bogart in not such a dark role. And I think it was really hard for people to, uh, to get into that. That being said, it certainly still got plenty of accolades. It was, it was very much praised. You know, uh, John Huston won, uh, best director for the film. He won best screenplay for the film. It was nominated for best picture. I, I still think it's a crime that Humphrey Bogart wasn't nominated for uh, best actor in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, what are you going to do? Um, I think it was a, uh, this was a, a year of, um, uh, Olivier for Hamlet. Well, I was just going to say, Hamlet. you know, a lot lost to Olivier's Hamlet. And to that, I only have to say, you know, seen it. <laughs> <laughs> but to not even get nominated. Now, yeah, now to be fair, I haven't seen, uh, the other four films, so I can't speak to the other performances, um, that would be Lou Ayers from Johnny Belinda, Montgomery Clift from The Search, Dan Daly from When My Baby Smiles at Me, and Clifton Webb from Sitting Pretty. I haven't seen any of those films, so I can't tell you in relation to those 
where Humphrey Bogart really fares. But I tell you, this I for my money, this was I think his best performance, and I just I love it. Um, but yeah, like I said, it it got a lot of other accolades, and this is a film that I, I think took time for people to tap into, and as time has worn on, it's become a film that people recognize as, you know, um, a classic. And I mean, Stanley Kubrick had it listed as his fourth favorite film of all time. Um, Sam Raimi said it's his favorite film of all time. Um, AFI put it on uh, number 30 of their top 100 movies. Um, it's, it's on actually quite a number of AFI's top thrills, top heroes and villains, top movie quotes, uh, film scores. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those films that is, has earned its place in the importance of American cinema. It's just at the time, I don't think people, I, I don't think it was what people were looking for at the film. They wanted, they were in, in the theaters. They wanted to go see Hamlet. Yeah. I wonder, uh, why. <laughs> I think you know part of it is it, it, it probably uh you know I think this movie is it deals with a sort of complex um it deals with sort of a complex sort of philosophical and and political undertone of of um you know how how we deal with um wealth and and uh you know at at the time uh that the movie was made there was uh, you know, consternation around dealing with wealth and growing wealth in, uh, and uh, what that, you know, if we're using this film as holding up that sort of cultural mirror again to, to audiences, um, this film often presents a, uh, you know, reflection that isn't pretty or palatable uh, and is very, very real. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that makes it difficult, uh, to, to accept. And, and again, uh, highlights how brave the movie is to, for, for Houston and Bogart and Walter Houston and Tim Holt to take on these roles, to tell the story in this way at this time. Um, you know, it, it risks, it, it risks careers and they all, they, they did a fantastic job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ted D. McCord on cinematography. I don't know Ted D. McCord. Uh, I don't either. I don't either. Uh, he's a. Um, let me look look him up real quick. Well, I uh, you know I, I bring it up because I I this was um, of note in this movie. The, the, a lot of this movie was filmed uh, on location. Yeah, that's, in, that's a pretty important part of the film. It, yeah. it is it on on location in Mexico, not only in Mexico, but you know they make a point of talking about how they, in the script about how they're in Tempico, and they actually shot in Tempico, uh, and uh, that's you know not they they did not choose to shoot in Toronto and make it look <laughs> like Tempico, uh, right? And so that that is of note. So why is why is that important? Well, shoot, you know, we've we've talked about this a little bit with the African Queen, but uh, and that was definitely an extreme example of shooting on location when you go to the remote jungles of Africa. This was, you know, just heading south of California into Mexico and filming in the Sierra Madre, but on the other side of the border. Um, but it was a location film, and there were not a lot of location films. It was very expensive, and still is to go shoot on location. And uh, the studio really, <laughs> you know, I believe Jack Warner, you know, watching the dailies of this every day um, would would yell at the screen uh, because, you know, when uh, I think there was a scene when um, they're trying to find water and um, and what did he say? He's he's like Jack Warner stood up during the screening. It's just like if 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 he doesn't find water, I'm. I, you know, it's going to bleed me dry or I can't remember what the quote is. It's, it's a lot funnier than, than I just, uh, let no, on. Good. You should probably just do it, try it again and see if you can get it better. I, I don't think I'm going to. It's not, this is not just a worse. problem of delivery. You don't think? Uh, I, I just don't remember the line. Okay. It's, it's a funny line, <laughs> but, um, he, it, this was a film that <laughs> due to many circumstances of filming in Mexico, caused it to go over budget and it, it became very uh, a, a very expensive proposition and while on one hand 
Jack Warner wanted to shut it down because it was going so over budget. On the other hand, he had a sense that there was something in this film that was going to be going to make it all worth it. And uh, and sure enough, I mean, it did become like like I said, a, a very popular film for Warner Brothers. It took quite a bit of time, but it did. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was a hard film to make. They were shooting on location. They had all these actors down in Mexico. They essentially took over this whole town. And you know John Huston. We talked about him in African Queen. If it's simple, it's not good enough. He found a location, the mountain that he wanted this this um the gold mine that they these guys dig any location that was too close to their um their base camp just seemed too close to civilization the mountain that he picked was way out in the boonies and so they had to travel every day to go way out to shoot and that's just you know that's the uh the challenge that he posed in making this film but it is those challenges that really enhance that reality of the story and i i think it made it a better film because of it I think so too. Um, I, I'm I'm looking. I'm, st- I'm stuck in research mode here, uh, <laughs> and so uh, yes. So you know, I was thinking about just the the structure of how they set up the, you know, how the film was was shot and how um, uh, you know one of the things that I like so much was this sense of compression. That I, you know, I'm attributing to to Ted McCord, whoever he is, and however brilliant he may be. Uh, Ted, Ted McCord, the Oscar-nominated uh, cinematographer, of The Sound of Music. <laughs> Sound of Music. That's where I've heard that name. <laughs> yes, and and actually, also the same year, Johnny Belinda. <laughs> Get him on your next picture, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> He's a stunner. Uh, I, I well, and now I can say with great authority, Ted McCord is brilliant. Uh, and, and the reason I like this so much is, is because there is, when you watch this film, which is a, a film of, uh, of sprawling, uh, vision, vision, you know, I mean, you're in the middle of the desert and the mountains, the high desert and, and these high passes, and you were looking over, you know, these, these wonderful sort of sprawling kind of old cityscapes, um, or, or townscapes uh, uh, climbing up and down these mountains. And yet there is such a wonderful sense of compression uh, that they use, you know, in each shot as, as uh, you know, um, Bogart's character goes more and more crazy. And it sort of starts uh, even right around the, uh, the mining. It's kind of a, you see them when they start panning for gold. Mm-hmm. You know, there is this sense of of sort of framing compression as they as they open the sluice gate and you see the water come down and they all their all their hands are now on the gold and you see this very sort of tangible and and it's it's a, a, a sort of, it's very seductive when yeah. they get their hands on the gold and they start like feeling the dust and they say, well, it doesn't even glimmer and uh, you know I expected it to glimmer uh, and and now they're pulling out these little uh, nuggets of gold from the water and then as he goes more and more crazy, it's it's closer and closer in to Bogart's face. And when he has that break as he's talking to himself, we've already mentioned that scene, the way the camera moves side to side on rails following him, tracking along with him at height, is uh, it, it, it's, it's crazy making. It makes you uncomfortable in your seat, sort of, to, to watch the way they, they introduce that, that compression and that movement with his, in, his growing insanity. Um, and and it's uh oh it's just it's just a fantastic uh exercise yeah and and that's the sort of camera work that is often uh subtle you don't notice it necessarily and it, you know John Huston as the director obviously has a big hand in that the director of photography also has a right. very big hand in that as the together they collaborate on how to tell the story the way it needs to be told um and, and we see perfect examples like we were talking about with uh with uh, Jack Cardiff in The African Queen yes. and how he used the camera to tell that story. Likewise, I think you're exactly right. Ted McCord here really knows how to use the camera and along with John Huston to give that sense of, uh, you know, if it's a claustrophobic sense as we, you know, as the everything gets shallower and we, we push in tighter and it's it really does uh, become a much more uncomfortable film to watch because of that. And we're pulled into that, that insanity with Dobbs. 
Well, and I, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I, I meant to comment about the, the, you know, dare you to sleep sequence. Yeah. Uh. Which just is so great. Uh, his, it, it, when he, his, Bogart's last line, you know, looking at, at Curtin, uh, what do we got over there? It's, uh, I'll bet you, what do we got? Uh, 35, 35, 35, $105,000 that you fall asleep before I do. <laughs> <laughs> and maniacal laughter echoing through the canyon. And from then on out, uh, you know, for the next couple of minutes, this sequence passes as they're daring each other to sleep, whether they're, they're literally stumbling down the side of this mountain following these mules. Uh, with their eyes, uh, you know, their eyes closing or, or sitting around the campfire the following night. It's, it is that sense of compression and, as you say, using the camera, uh, to tell the story really artfully. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really brilliantly done. And, uh, I I just, I, (laughs) that's another sequence I had, I forgot about them or in our conversation, but boy, is that a, just a creepy sequence. It is so creepy. And it, it's, uh, it's the first time where, where I think, you know, to the point about Bogart, um, you know, taking on this more of a character role, um, it, it's a sequence that introduces not just crazy, but maniacally crazy, like mean crazy. Yeah. Like he hasn't just lost his, his senses. He is, he's out to hurt others. Yeah, yeah. He he truly has crossed a line by yeah. that point. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. And I think paired with all of that that we've been talking so far, um, you know, I, I have to mention Max Steiner and his uh, wonderful music for this film. I, I thought it was just, uh, just perfect. And it works so well in the film. And moments like that, I think it just really highlights the moments and brings you in that much more to those characters. Truly, um, you know, we should say, uh, you know, I, I, we should also talk about uh, we uh, the, you know, we talk about his role as Curtin, but but uh, Tim Holt, uh, and what he delivered in in this film uh, had I think a sh- I think a shorter career than some of these other guys, but um, uh, man, he. He's one of those guys you feel like watching him on screen is not it is timeless. His performance is absolutely timeless. And it's funny because you he, he's so likable in this film and you feel so so bad for what happens to him. But man, watch this and um Orson Welles' second film, The Magnificent Ambersons, watch those back to back, and you're just gonna hate him because he's so <laughs> awful in that film. Uh so it's it's great to see. But yeah, he you know, his career didn't really jump the way that uh that i think that he wanted it to i think he tried uh getting out of the westerns but i think he you know just when he thought he got out they pulled him back yeah. in and he he really had a career in in westerns and you know i i love him in westerns i think he's great um i have no problem with him being in westerns but uh Um, Well, that's what I mean. I mean, you know, all these other characters, you feel like these are characters you're watching in a movie that, you know, a movie that was made in 1948, except for Tim Holt, who I think you could just as easily um, uh, colorize and put him, uh, you know, next to a um, disintegrating, you know, Brad Pitt. uh, And suddenly you have uh, the the death of Jesse James uh, by the coward Robert Ford. I mean, mm-hmm. he, he could have just as easily, you yeah. know, uh, outlasted his own career. Um, yeah. He was just a timeless and solid and, um, you know, stable performance in this movie, around which these other sort of crazy performances could orbit really effectively. Yeah. Yeah, you're he's right. An, I he's mean, an he's anchor. Just, he's he's so great. And I just, I love Tim Holt. He's uh, he's always been a great actor um, in uh I love watching him. He's just captivating on screen. Truly. Uh, let's see. Who else do we need to talk about in this movie? What else stucks out for you? Well, Alfonso Bedoya um, <laughs> really stands out <laughs> as Gold Hat, the head of the yeah. the bandits. And I think a big part of that is because his line has become one of the classic uh, lines in cinema that has been spoofed time and time again, whether it's Bugs Bunny or or Mel Brooks, 
you know, his line about the badges is just yeah. <laughs> such a classic. And he is so great. You just he's on screen and he's he's so mischievous and you can tell he's just up to no good, but he's he's laughing and he's smiling and he's just he's a great great actor. I mean, he started acting um he came i can't remember when he came into the, what how he came into the scene but he came in in the mid 30s and he really played this sort of mexican character for uh, hollywood films uh, very well and for a very long time all the way up i think he ended up having an alcohol problem and died in the in the 50s but i mean he's been in tons of movies did you i i have this feeling about that line i mean he's obviously that that <laughs> he's been in a ton of movies but you know uh that's that's that, what he'll always be remembered that's for. That's what he's remembered for. That that line has become the Wilhelm scream of of lines, right? You know, I mean, it's in everything, and <laughs> I was really surprised at all the places that the movie was, or that line has been in. Uh, I I remember it more from Blazing Saddles, uh, right? Because that was you know that's a movie I. had seen long before I ever saw Treasure of Sierra Madre. And so it was only then that I, you know, I thought to myself, you know, the, when I first saw Sierra Madre, I thought, wow, they totally got that line wrong. <laughs> uh, of course, the movie is made, you know, 30 years later. Uh, and it has been, um, you know, the original line, badges, we ain't got no badges, we don't need no badges, I don't have to show you any stinking badges. Right. And the line has been, you know, as it's been massaged, it has now become badges. We don't need no stinking badges. And that actually the first, as far as I know, the first time it was used was Mickey Dolan's on The Monkees uh, in 1967. Uh, Interesting. It, not Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles, it looks like, was the, the next major appearance of that line in 1974. And from then on, it's been in everything. Uh, it has. Including it has. 1983's Wizards and Warriors, in which it was uttered as badgers. We don't need no stinking badgers. <laughs> classic, classic. <laughs> it's just the same thing like with Casablanca, how yeah. at no point does anyone actually say, play it again, Sam. It's the same yes. thing. Yes, yes, it is. It is so. the same thing. <sighs> Bogart movies. I know, I know. They're just so stinking good. So, so the, the mysterious B. Traven. Yeah. Talk about what you talk about the, the writer. So the, the, this author is a very, a very mysterious author who nobody really knows much about him. Um, it was a pen name. Um, they think he was German. Uh, there's not a lot, um, to help people define the specifics. Um, he lived in Mexico for a good chunk of his life and, you know, obviously set the treasure of the Sierra Madre there. And when John Huston wanted to make this movie, he contacted B. Traven through letters because that's the only way to contact this mysterious person. And they had a correspondence about it and they, they kind of, you know, through script ideas back and forth. I, you know, in the original novel, it's not um, Gold Hat and his bandits who come across uh, Dobbs at the end and and kill him. It's um, just some drifters, just some random drifters. And it was John Huston's idea, you know, the, this, this Gold Hat's really kind of a key figure. What if we brought him back? And B. Traven actually loved that idea, thought it was great. Um, you know, there were other ideas that came across that he didn't like so much, and they they worked on it together. But at no point did John Huston see this person or ever talk to this person um, on the phone or anything like that. So they're shooting the movie, and a mysterious short man appears who says he is the, you know, like a translator for B. Traven, or he's the guy who's you know, the communicator, he's, he's the window to B. Traven. And, um, since B. Traven won't be able to come to set, he's going to be the person who is representing him at, on the set. And, um, uh, everything that, you know, B. Traven needed to know, just tell this guy and he would get it back to B. Traven so that B. Traven was kept in the loop. And John Houston 
was convinced that this person was actually B. Traven and just not telling people. And he would keep telling people, oh, you're just B. He's B. Traven. And it was this big mystery on set as to who this guy was, and everybody thought it was B. Traven. It's just is this this crazy situation. And nobody ever really knew. And there ended up being some some disagreements and and uh I, I don't think the um I, I think once the film it some of it did get shot um back up in California and once the film moved up there the studio cut back his weekly allowance and so he he left the set he just didn't want to uh take the cut in wages and left the set and they shot the rest of it without him and i think as i recall i don't think he um said much much if anything about the film once it came out and i don't think that um he was very happy with it and i think that um i i you know i can't quite remember what it was but um there was this there was a like a disagreement between John Houston and and B Traven about the story or something like that but uh um yeah it's it this he's this really mysterious character and nobody really knows what the answers are to to the story with him so it it lent while they were shooting the film it just kind of lent this air of of uh mystery to it and so it's kind of it was kind of a fun little uh fun little little thing that was going on in the film that is fantastic. Yeah, it's just I did not know strange. any of that. Yeah, he, I think that his name, the what he introduced himself at as when he came to the set was Hal Croves, and um, that's you know he said he, oh he said he was the translator and right. um, yeah so it's just a, a very weird thing. It's just very weird. I as I'm looking at I, I just. I'm looking at the other uh, other theories page here, right? And it's it's really funny. Yeah, there are uh, lots of theories. The other theories I B. Traven was, in fact, the American writer Jack London, who faked his death and moved to Mexico and continued writing books. B. Traven is the pseudonym of American writer Ambrose Bierce, who went to Mexico in 1913. B. Traven is the pseudonym of Adolfo Lopez Mateos, the president of Mexico in the years 8, 1958 <laughs> to 1964. Yeah, a, a, lot, awesome. of, a lot of things. Uh, somebody said he was even like the Kaiser's son. Illegitimate son of the Ger- German Emperor Wilhelm II. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's very, one of those we don't ever want to know. fascinating stories. It, it is fascinating. What an interesting story about how this how this story actually was massaged into this movie. Yeah. Uh, and the supposed portrait of B. Traven on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> yeah. I, I love it's it. It's like... Who really knows? Who is that guy with that cigarette? Uh, and all of the, uh, you know, he may have been born February 23rd, 1882, or the 25th, or May 3rd. Uh, uh, wow. But yeah, it's it's really fascinating. That is that is really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, B. Traven, and, he, and a writer of uh, 12 novels and other reportage, mm-hmm. uh, a, in, mostly in German. Uh, really interesting. So there's B. Traven, uh, wrote the book for Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Uh, where do we go from here? Are we, what else do you have on your list? You know, did... I think, um, uh, well, we, you know, we talked about on, uh, African Queen, um, mm-hmm. the lovely Lauren Bacall, uh, came out and I, I think we talked about how she came out on that film, uh, to be with, uh, Bogey. Um, likewise, she came out on this one and, uh, was, essentially kind of the same thing. She kind of became kind of a support staff back at the hotel. She was helping cook meals and just, she was being like just a, a you know, some, somebody to kind of help everybody feel more at home. And so it's uh, it was very nice to have her along. And I think uh, everyone, everyone appreciated it. Very generous of her maternal spirit. That it, it was definitely was. Uh, oh, and the other, uh, another fun little note is um, the kid, you know, the kid who sells, um, yes, the, the lottery, lottery numbers. Uh, that kid uh, was Robert Blake, who was one of the little rascals. Huh. He began in our gang. Yeah. I did not make that connection. Yeah, pretty crazy. Uh, uh, yes. Hey, Robert Blake, man, he he's been he's been around. Well, he's been around and he's, uh, you know, things haven't gone so well for him. Yeah, no, he had some real, uh, 
<laughs> some real trouble. Uh, he has, yeah. It's it's uh, it hasn't gone well for him. I mean, it, you know, his his own fault, I suppose. Um, it's it's pretty tragic how things ended up for him. But um, yeah, I mean, he, you know, started working with the Little Rascals and went, you know, through many many movies and TV shows, and uh, you know, I think the last film he was in was Lost Highway, uh, David Lynch's film. Yeah. That, uh, you know, I think it was his last film before um, his big uh, uh, murder conviction, so. Murder conviction of his, um, uh, it was his wife, right? Um, yes, I think so. I think so. And, uh, you know, I, it was, was his ten, wife, yeah. and I, I don't think he was convicted, was he? He was acquitted. He was acquitted, and then I think the problem was he was, he was acquitted for m murder, but his children sued him afterward yeah. in a in a civil case and he had to pay tens of millions of dollars uh in the civil court yeah and, and now he you know reportedly is broke and is hoping to work again but yeah. i don't think anybody has taken him back yet but you know beretta <laughs> <laughs> right am i right in cold blood i in mean cold blood uh, he is a man who has has been around. Yeah, oh, well. I mean, like... from the Little Rascals to John Huston to David Lynch. I mean, yeah, he is a heck of a career. It just is—it's mind-boggling how much stuff he's done. Truly, yeah. All right. So, uh, is that uh, does that close the book on uh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre for you? Uh, you know, I think it does. I, you know, like I said, it was—it's. Um, it, the all those who vote on IMDb, um, you know, consider it John Huston's uh, best film, and it's my for for my money, it's my favorite of John Huston's films. I mean, I definitely I do put it above Maltese Falcon and African Queen as much as I love those films. Um, they're probably you know so close seconds, but uh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, I just think is it's it's a timeless classic, and it represents. All that is best about film. I said it at the beginning. I think this movie highlights uh, real bravery in in uh, you know making movies that uh, that test uh, you know the stamina of one's career. And and this this was a great example of that movie back in in the forties. And it's it was terrific. Absolutely lives up to its legacy. Yep. Yep. All right. That's all I got. Fantastic. Well, find us at thenextreel.com. Make sure to head over there. Check out the blog. Check out the trailers that we talk about incessantly. And uh, over at Facebook.com slash The Next Reel, where you can like us there and get all sorts of updates uh, to new shows and movie news that we post uh, occasionally. And, uh, you know, you can also leave us a message at 657-201-7335, 657-201-REAL. And uh, we just might play that on the air. Or you can write us at show at thenextreel.com. Uh, you can find Andy over at, so uh, at uh, Soda Creek Film on the Twitter and me at Pete Wright. And I think, uh, I think just, that just about does it. If you're listening to us on iTunes, do us a favor, head over there and leave us a uh, five-star review and a comment that is very, very helpful for other people to discover this show. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's it. I think that's really it. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop. Right. Buenos noches. Buenos noches. See. Sí. We wanted to take a moment to thank you for your continued support over the years. It's hard to believe that we've been having weekly in-depth discussions about movies since 2011. That's right, 12 years and counting. Producing this show is a labor of love for us, but it does require a lot of time and effort each week. If you enjoy our podcast and would love to help keep it going, there are some easy ways you can show your support. One is by using our Originals page to shop for the original source material that movies we've discussed were based on. That's right. In season one alone, we covered 13 films adapted from books or plays, from Charlie Kaufman's adaptation to David Fincher adaptations like Fight Club. In season two, we covered even more, like Powell and Pressburger's The Red Shoes and The African Queen from our series about legendary cinematographer Jack Cardiff. We can't forget about the four Jason Bourne movies we talked about. Love those movies. Well... The original trilogy, at least. <laughs> for our Richard D. Zanuck series, we did Jaws, Rush, Big Fish, and more. And for our horror series, we talked about John Carpenter's The Thing, which was adapted from Who Goes There? 
We did our first great car chase series with movies like Bullet, The French Connection, and Drive. And for the holidays, we did Preston Sturgis's Christmas in July. We had a great John Huston series with adaptations like The Maltese Falcon and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And for our baseball series, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Have I told you lately how much I love that movie? Uh, yeah, I think you have. Plus, our Magician series and Heist film series had adaptations as well. Tons of page-to-screen gems. Listeners can find the details and links to the original material at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, or movie you buy through our links helps support the show, and it's no extra cost to you. So dive in and get your next read today. Thenextreel.com slash originals has all the films adapted from other sources that not only we have covered, but all of the shows on the Next Real family of podcasts. Check it out and get reading. Support the show and build your reading list. It's a win-win. Head to thenextreel.com slash originals.